Well, uh, welcome everybody. Really glad that you're uh, listening to this and watching it uh, on, online. Uh, we're coming down to the conclusion of this uh, class, the uh, Understanding the Forerunner Call, and uh, I don't know, I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I really have enjoyed writing it and preparing it and teaching it and uh, uh, been kind of meditating on these topics for really uh, eight to 10 years probably. Uh, but it really, in uh, these, this last time in writing it, the Lord has just really unveiled things to me that I was not aware of uh, in, but prior to that. So I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you are enjoying it as well. Um, we want, we've got two more sessions. We have, this is session 11 of Understanding the Forerunner Call, and then we have one more session, session 12. And in these last two sessions, we're going to be talking about the journey of the forerunner. Um, you know, just to give you a little bit of review, and, and I know, hope this doesn't get too repetitive, but I think it's helpful uh, to help us understand where we've been and, and what we've got left to do. Uh, in the first uh, session, we talked about that we're living in days very, very similar to the days in which Elijah ministered and John the Baptist as well. Uh, very similar issues that are facing this generation. Uh, so we talked about that. Then in the second session, we talked about the fact that we're talking about end-time forerunners preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. There have been forerunners throughout history, uh, and we've talked some about those, but we're talking about end-time ones that, that will, whatever the date is, whether it's a generation or multiple generations, we're talking about a call that will ultimately usher in the second coming of Christ. That was session two. Then in session three, four, and five, we dealt in detail with Luke chapter 1, 16 and 17, which is speaking of John the Baptist, but about calling him as a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the people back to God, to back to Christ, and to uh, turn the attitude of the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, the fathers to the sons, and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we dealt in a, a lot of detail there. Then in session six, we shifted to talk about the fact that forerunners are a voice. Uh, you, you know, we, we kind of dealt a lot with signs and wonders versus being a voice. Uh, and we are, forerunners are primarily a voice. Now, we love signs and wonders when they happen and we believe in them. Uh, we, we like it and we, we love ministering in them. It's nothing maybe more exciting. One of the most exciting things in the Christian ministry is praying for somebody and they get, they get healed or something like that, or a miracle works in their life. So we're not d denying that in any way, but the primary purpose of the forerunner call is to be a voice, a voice. And that, that we really need to get that uh, in our hearts, <clears throat> that we're to be a voice into the church. We're be, being a voice to heaven on behalf of the church. We're to be a voice into the governmental systems, into the culture. Uh, and to the Lord on behalf of the governmental systems and then on behalf of the culture. Uh, so we're to be a voice. And then in sessions 7 through 10, we dealt with four specific functions of the forerunner. The forerunner as a messenger uh, who would go and, <coughs> and basically invite people into a new way of relating to God based on Scripture, uh, to come out of old and erroneous things and to come into the things that God is saying to this generation in the context of the, of the biblical context. And then we talked about forerunners as wise master builders who would take those who say yes to the invitation and to build a spiritual environment, whether it's in their life or whether it's in a church or, or a denomination or whatever it could be, to build a spiritual environment that would facilitate God's eternal purpose. Uh, and so we do, did that. And then we talked about forerunners as intercessors, uh, where there is a primary function. Forerunner, you really can't be a forerunner without being a prayer warrior. And so we talked a good bit about that. Then in the, uh, session 10, we talked about forerunners as friends of the bridegroom. The ultimate purpose of the church age is to prepare a bride for Christ. We see that in Revelation chapter 19, that when uh, the bride is made ready, Christ will return. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how evil the world gets, uh, the Lord's not going to come back until his bride is made ready in sufficient numbers uh, for, for him to have that worthy bride to be his eternal partner forever and ever and ever. So we talked about forerunner's role in that. 
Uh, and then now we, we switch in these last two sessions to looking at the, the, the journey of the forerunner. And there are two real dynamics that I want to look at, and uh, we'll only get to one of those and not even complete one of those in this session, but two dynamics, and that is one, the preparation of the forerunner, uh, the journey of preparation, and then we'll look at it in the next session after we complete the preparation part with the, the journey of ministry uh, of the forerunner. We'll kind of touch on it a little bit uh, today, but we'll get into a variety of aspects of it in the next session. So we have about, I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but we have about eight uh, steps that we're going to deal with in this session and the next uh, in this journey of the forerunner. And we'll deal with really with four in this session. We'll deal uh, first with the necessity of preparation. Then we'll look at being called and commissioned. Uh, third, we'll look at the, uh, the attitude or the uh, aspect of complete surrender to the call. Uh, and then fourth, we'll look at the need to come outside the camp. Uh, all very important steps of preparation. And, uh, you know, God willing, I'll share a few of my own steps of my own journey because um, I, I got this from the scriptures, these steps from the scriptures. But as I look back and compare them to the journey that I've been on over uh, since 96, 97, so a good many years, uh, I see that the Lord has led me through these very same steps. And I believe he will you uh, as well as you take up the forerunner call. Now, I do really believe we're in an accelerated time uh, frame right now, an accelerated season, uh, and that God will take you through these steps a lot quicker than he did me. I, when I was going through this, there were very at least that I was aware of, very few forerunners, and the Lord had called me to that. Now, there were those that were mentoring us, but I was having to learn a lot uh, without really a mentor uh, who, well, I had mentors, but not, not really somebody who could tell me step by step what I had to do. So I think you'll, you'll go through it quicker than I will, but uh, there is a preparation process. I do want to, before I pray, I do want to say this one Thing. I don't want you to think that as a forerunner that you can just read through these notes and watch the videos and listen to the teachings, uh, look up the scriptures related to them and say, okay, I'm now been commissioned as a forerunner. Uh, uh, absolutely not. It takes a season of intense preparation, uh, sometimes difficult seasons of preparation to be prepared as a as a forerunner so anyway we'll get into we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute so let's uh let's pray and then after the prayer we'll, we'll we will uh dig into these four things that i mentioned uh, just a minute ago uh, heavenly father we thank you for this day i uh, just love you lord and we all do and we pray that you would open up your scriptures open up uh concepts open up testimonies and uh, ideas, illustrations that will help us all to understand this journey that the forerunner must undertake, as we, especially this week as we talk about the preparation of the forerunner. So we pray these things. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, and ask you to come, Holy Spirit, and take control. Uh, confess that apart from you, I can do nothing. And I ask for that anointing in the name of Jesus. So, Father, come, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Um, I want to start out with talking about the necessity of preparation, and I talked a little bit about it already, but I want, to, uh, I want us to look first at uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, a very familiar verse of Scripture, um, starting actually the last part of uh, 9. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah and said, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow, and to build, and to plant. Um, and, of course, we know that was Jeremiah's call. He was called to do that uh, in Israel, and he ministered in that uh, way. Now, that verse of Scripture, I believe, characterizes a lot of what God's doing in the church of our day. He's plucking up, he's overthrowing, he's destroying old mindsets and old traditions and old wineskins 
that will not, that will not be sufficient for the days are, that are coming. Uh, you know as well as I do that as, as we turn the, uh, as God turned the calendar from 2019 to 2020, it would seem like there was a switch flipped on and things are different. Uh, and we're all trying to figure out how to, how to live and how to thrive in these different issues. And I think and that, are, that we're facing and that the prophets are saying are going to even continue to get more uh, difficult and more glorious at the same time is what I believe. But um, uh, anyway, in the midst of that, the Lord is doing a deep work and wants to do a deep work in his church to, to overthrow these these things that we've lived in for uh, generations and maybe even centuries in some cases uh, that are not sufficient uh, for what's coming in the end times. They will not make a people ready in God's eternal purpose. They will not make a people ready uh, for eternity. And so he's doing that so that he can build and plant. He's doing both, overcoming the old and building and planting the new. That's what he's doing. I believe what he's doing in the church. And forerunners are critical in that role. God is raising up a company of forerunners around the earth where that will be their, their primary function, to, to be vessels uh, to help the church to pluck up and, and root up all these old wineskins, all old mindsets, uh, so that God can plant new uh, truths in them. Now, when I say new, I'm not talking about things that are not biblical. I'm talking about biblical truths uh, that have been uh, ignored or uh, are now just being unveiled to the church and those types of things. But they're been in the scriptures all the time. So that's what God's doing in the church. He wants to use forerunners as, as his voice into that role. But here's the point I want to make for today is that in order for that to be, if order, for order for you to be used that way, for, in order for you to be used that way, what God wants to do in us as his forerunners is he wants to take us through this same process. He wants to do, as we said in uh, Jeremiah, he wants to pluck up and break down, destroy and to overthrow the things in our own life, our own walk, our own ministry, our own approach to God that will not be sufficient, uh, that will not help us to be a voice into, into the church uh, he wants to pull out uh, all those things, and, and then he wants to plant and, 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 and uh, build new things in us so that we can be a voice uh, into the church. That, that's where we are. So there's a journey. There's a journey that forerunners have to go through in order to be prepared to be this voice. I don't want you to think for a moment, and I said this a minute ago, but I want to say it again, I don't, I, want, I don't want you to think for a moment that you can just read through this material and say, I'm ready, I'm a forerunner, go ahead, I'm going to the nations. You know, we have this idea that I learn it the week one, I learn it, week two, I teach it to my church, week three, I take it to the nations. Uh, now, that will not work with this call. There is a preparation process uh, that the Lord will take you through uh, to prepare you to be a forerunner. But if you will go through it, and this is an if, but I think I really believe that there are many in the Forerunner School uh, who will say yes to this preparation process. If you'll go through it, if you will, then God will use you exceedingly abundantly. You know, there's a scripture verse, uh, Ephesians 3 verse 20 comes to mind. Uh, and I, I love this verse of scripture. But now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, the Holy Spirit, to him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, God can and he will. I really believe he will do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think if we will submit to his preparation process. That uh, phrase that I've used in prior sessions about from the movie Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. Uh, my, I'll change it a little bit, but build it and he will send you. Build it in your own life and he will send you. He'll open up doors that you could not even imagine that he would open up uh, for you. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly and if you'll go through the preparation process, uh, 
he will, he's not going to waste it. He'll use you. It may be to your next door neighbor. It may be to a local church. It may be uh, to a nation or nations. Who knows? But he will use you if you will make, if you will put your energy and effort into saying, Lord, prepare me. Prepare me as a forerunner. I want to be made ready. So there's a necessity for preparation. That's the first point that we wanted to bring up. Now, the second point I want to talk about is, is the idea of being called and commissioned. And the preparation process is in, the, uh, in between those two points, between the call and the commissioning. Now, you know, we never end being, uh, well, God never finishes preparing us. But there is a preparation process between the call uh, and the commissioning. So let's look at this. You know, God's forerunners that we've been talking about, they all went through a time of preparation. I want to make sure we understand that. Um, you know, let's look at um, 1 Kings. I'm first about, talk about Elijah. He was used, he, he was taken to a time of preparation. 1 Kings 17, verse 2, after he had prophesied the drought to come on the land, the word of the Lord, verse 2, the, Lord of the word of the Lord came to him saying, verse 3, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself to the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. Uh, and it goes on there. But God took him out of the mainstream of the religious activity of the day for a three and a half year period. Now we know it's three and a half year period from James who talks about that where the drought lasted three and a half years. So God took Elijah out of the mainstream of activity for three and a half years and he was working in him. He took him first to the brook Cherith and we'll deal with that in a lot more detail in the next session uh, about what God accomplished at brook Cherith. Uh, then he took him to Zarephath and we'll look at that in the next session too and what God accomplished there. So I'm not going to take the time to go into that now. We'll do that in the next session. But the point is that God took Elijah, uh, through a preparation process, before he was commissioned to go back uh, into the mainland and to confront the prophets of Asher and the prophets of Baal. Uh, there was a preparation process that he had to go through to prepare him for that call. So we see that with Elijah. But we also see it with Elisha. Uh, we see it in 1 Kings uh, 19. Um, 1 Kings 19, starting with about verse uh, 15 or 16, or 16, where God tells Elijah to anoint Elisha as to be the prophet in your place. Uh, so he calls him to, to raise up Elisha as a spiritual son to be the prophet in his place. And then uh, verse 19, we'll, we'll deal with this in a minute. I won't read it right now. Uh, he, he goes and he, and he calls Elisha. Now, Elisha didn't really get commissioned as Elijah's replacement to a number of years later. He was called in, in 1 Kings 19, but it was 2 Kings, like chapter 2, I believe it is, where he actually took Elijah's mantle as Elijah was caught up to heaven. Now, there was a preparation process in between there. And, and you know, we see that he, uh, we'll look at it in more detail in a minute, but he ran after, he laid everything down and he ran after Elijah. Uh, in other words, he pursued this forerunner ministry, the spirit and the power of Elijah. He pursued it during a preparation period. Now, we kind of think, okay, uh, this is kind of what was in my mind until I began to really study it that God said to Elijah, anoint Elisha. Uh, and he did it, and like uh, 30 days later, Elisha was uh, caught up uh, to, uh, Elijah was caught up to heaven and Elisha took over. No, it wasn't that. It was at least four or five years. If you begin to look at, uh, you know, commentaries and, you know, Google searches of, about this, you'll see that it's, you know, anywhere from four or five years to 12 years or somewhere, there was a, there was a fair amount of time in between Elisha's call and his commissioning. And it was a preparation time. Now, of course, he ministered some in that, in that period, but it was, a, it was a preparation time. So we see it in Elijah. We see it in Elisha. Uh, now, we see it also in the Apostle Paul. Uh, we, the, you know, Paul was called 
We're talking about called and commissioned. Paul was called on the road to Damascus where Jesus encountered him on the road. He repented and he turned and he, he went uh, to, pursue, uh, to pursue Christ wholeheartedly. But you see this a lot in Galatians and it's, it's too much to read here. Uh, but Galatians chapter 1, uh, really the, a lot of the whole chapter, but 11, chap, verses 11 through 24, you see this. You see that what happened that after uh, God had called and confronted uh, Paul uh, on the road to Damascus, he took him for a three-year period into Arabia, uh, and he was hidden. He was basically hidden there. Now, he ministered some during that time. Not to say he didn't do any ministry, but he was not yet commissioned to go on his missionary journeys. There was a time of preparation. God had taken him out of the mainstream, and what was he doing? He was rooting up. He was plucking up. He was overthrowing. Paul was a leader in the movement that was persecuting Christ. And so God had to pull all that out of him. And at the same time, he gave him revelation. I believe that that's when he got his revelation, caught up to the third heaven and got his revelation of God's eternal purpose and all the things there during that time of preparation. So there was a pulling away, a pulling out, a tearing down, and a building up with, with fresh things. And so Paul had to go through that. And even when he, uh, when he came back and he went to Jerusalem to meet with Peter, he met with Peter and James, but he still didn't meet with all the rest of them. God was separating him uh, from the mainstream and preparing him for what his ultimate call would be. And so we see this with these, uh, with these biblical forerunners that God took them out of the mainstream of activity, called them out of that for a season of preparation before they were ultimately co commissioned uh, in those things. Now, there's another scripture I want us to look at uh, uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians is, uh, is 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter uh, 2. Uh, let me just turn there. Uh, this is really an interesting verse. Uh, really an interesting verse. And it talks, and Paul's talking about his own life and his team, his ministry team. And, and here's what he uh, he's talking to the Thessalonians. He says in verse chapter two, verse First Thessalonians chapter two, verse three. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but but, but God who examines our heart. Um, there's a lot more in there uh, uh, in uh, verse 11 and 12 kind of is a conclusion of that. I'll read that. Just as you know how we exhort, are exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father with his own children so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the, of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and his own glory. So what is he saying? He said, God did a work of preparation in me so that I could be a father, a spiritual father, a forerunner to you to bring you into these same things. And, and so look at what he did. Look at what he did. He said, um, for our exodation does not come from error. So what did he do? He corrected his teaching. He corrected his doctrine. He took him out of some of this old, old wineskin and brought him into a new. He corrected his doctrine. He corrected him from error. He also uh, separated him from impurity. In other words, he worked in his character. Uh, his character, I mean, he was a murderer of, of Christians and he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, fervent in his opposition to Christ. And so he had to be, his character had to be transformed uh, as well. And by way of deceit, he took him out of deceit. He had to purify his motives uh, so that he's uh, approved. And so, God has to do that in us. He has to correct our doctrine. Uh, he has to work in our character to, bring, to transform our character. And he has to purify our motives. Really, really important that we allow God to do all these things. And so, see, after that season, he was approved by God. In other words, he was called. There was a preparation that took place. 
And at the end of that preparation process, he was approved of God and, in, and therefore commissioned to go forth into his missionary journeys. And of course, he wrote much of the New Testament and, and we still follow his teachings so much. Uh, so, and then he got boldness too. Not, I'm not pleasing man, but God. Uh, and so that people can be exhorted and implored to come out of the old and to come uh, in uh, to the new. And so we see this is kind of the purpose of this time uh, in the call and the, uh, and, uh, the commissioning. Um, and so in a similar way, as end time forerunners, we have to go through this same process, just like Elijah, just like Elisha, just like Paul. And we have to, God has to accomplish these same types of things that we talked about in 1 Thessalonians in our hearts and in our lives to be able to be used of God as his forerunners. Um, I, I know just my, my own personal journey. I was called, and we've shared some of this before, but I was called as a forerunner in 1996 and it was secured in 97. But the Lord didn't send me out, begin to send me out with a forerunner message. And even in the beginning, it was just the, the beginning of that message uh, until around 2000, 1999 or 2000. He began to, he did a work in me uh, to prepare me uh, for that. I mean, I remember the first time uh, that I really taught it. I mean, I did a little bit. First missionary trip I ever took was to Honduras. And he used me a little bit there. But he began to, he sent me to Fiji after that for two or three times in Fiji. And I would teach some. But I remember uh, the first time he sent me to Fiji, I was teaching about 400 things, although I didn't really realize it really at the time. Uh, but it, it was a, uh, under a kind of a shed uh, with benches, a few benches, and about three people showed up uh, to, to watch it, to listen to it. So, you know, it was very humble beginnings, uh, but God took me through a preparation process during that time. I, he, it was very difficult for me. There was, uh, it was just like the Lord was stripping so much out of me and uh, the, at the church, it was a very difficult time at the church. People were leaving and things like that. And at the same time, the only, the only place I, I found any solitude was in my quiet time with the Lord. I remember there was the, the Winds of Worship series were uh, kind of on CDs, music and worship at that point in time. And I remember just living off of uh, that worship in my private time. But in that, in that time, God was stripping things out of me, but he was also giving me a lot of revelation. He began to open up the book of Esther. And, uh, you know, my only time of real joy in ministry, I uh, still had joy in my family, but the only joy in ministry was, came in, the pri in the, my private time with the Lord as he was preparing uh, me uh, during this time. But one of the things that he did in me, and I think he, if, especially to pastors, I think he'll do this in you, he was purifying my motives. When I was called uh, into the ministry, uh, one of the things that the Lord, uh, well, not the Lord, one of the things that I had a desire in was I wanted this large church. I wanted to, uh, to be uh, approved by all men. I wanted uh, to be a successful teacher and get the accolades of man and all of those kinds of things. And so God had to take, take, purify my motives uh, to the point, okay, you know, and I'm sure there's still more to go. I don't, don't want to come across like I've arrived, but I know there's a real um, change there in that right now my goal is to be a vessel, a mouthpiece for God. I want to please him. And I don't, I mean, I, obviously I like to get compliments. Everybody needs that from time to time. But the point is, that doesn't drive me anymore. I'm, my motive is to, to be a vessel for God, to be, to be pleasing unto him. And that takes a work of preparation. You know, that has like, that's a stripping to do that most of us is who are in ministry leadership. And so for those in, who are pastors who are in the 400 school, listen, let God do it. Because if you want to please man, if you want a glorious uh, expression on earth, you'll never be a forerunner. Because a lot of your message 
will call people out of where they're comfortable, call them out of the things they like into something new, into something different. It will not be a popularity contest, tell, uh, believe me. And so let God do that work of preparation between the call uh, and the commissioning. Um, so that's the second point. You know, we talked about necessity of preparation. We've talked about the difference between the call and the commissioning. Um, uh, and so now let's talk about a third. The third point is complete surrender, complete surrender. Um, and we want to look at this, at Elisha primarily here, uh, Elijah and Elisha, uh, in terms of complete surrender. So if you look at, and I'll read, I want to read this first passage, 1 Kings 19, verse 19 through 21. It's in your notes, but you can look it up in the scriptures too. It said, here is what it says. So he, talking of Elijah, Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shephat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen <coughs> before him. And he was with the 12th. And so Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. This was the call, not the commissioning. Uh, he, Elisha, left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother. Then I will follow you. And he, Elijah, said to him, Go back again. For what have I done to you? Uh, so he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them <coughs> and boiled them with their flesh and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen. So he destroyed the implements uh, and, the, and the oxen and he gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and he ministered to him. Okay, this is the call. And then, like I said, it's several years later, I'm not going to read this next one, in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9 through 14, that's when he got his commissioning. Um, but there was, a, there was an aspect of complete surrender to the call that took place uh, at the time of the call in order to be prepared to be commissioned. And had he not surrendered like this, he would have not had, taken Elijah's mantle. Even though there was a call there, because Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen. So there is a preparation process there uh, that is necessary to allow God to do if we're going to be commissioned into this forerunner call. Now let's look at this in the context of Elisha completely surrendering, in this case, to the forerunner call, to follow after Elijah, which is a picture of the forerunner call, the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's what it is to us. So here's some points related to surrender. First, uh, surrender is the response to an invitation uh, from the Lord to become a forerunner. As you'll notice from that, Elijah, God first in, in 19 earlier, God spoke to Elijah and said, anoint Elisha. There was, it came from the throne. Elijah was a, uh, a voice from the throne to Elisha and he invited him into the forerunner call. Uh, so Elisha didn't go after Elijah and say, hey, I want to be, I, I want to be your um, uh, spiritual son. I want to take up your call. It wasn't that as much as Elijah came to Elisha. And here's, this is the point for us. Uh, the, the invitation comes from God. Elisha didn't seek Elijah. Elijah sought Elisha, uh, and gave him the invitation uh, to follow him uh, in ministry. Uh, so it's an invitation uh, from uh, the Lord. You know, that's definitely what happened to me. That's definitely what happened to me in my call, both into ministry and into, into, into the forerunner call. I wasn't seeking it. Um, uh, now, well, I do want to say this. I want to make sure you understand this. I'm not saying that you have to hear an audible voice from the Lord uh, at, that he's calling you to be a forerunner in order to be that. Absolutely not. For me, it was a clear call uh, where I knew that, but it wasn't an encounter with the Lord. It wasn't where Jesus came to me externally and encountered me. It was that still small voice 
in my heart, both as a call to leave business and go into ministry, and then secondarily to go into the forerunner call. Uh, so it could be in a lot of different ways. It could be that God speaks it to you. It could be that he just gives you a heart for these issues. That's a big sign that he's calling you that way. If you have a heart to see the church transformed, to see a bride made ready, uh, to see all those kinds of things that we've talked about transpire in the church, then it's a good sign that you're called as a forerunner, that God is calling you as a forerunner. So the call can come in a lot of ways, but it comes as an invitation. It comes as an invitation. I mean, when, when God called me into ministry, I was in business, and uh, I was not even interested. I, I, I mean, I, at that point, I was walking with the Lord, and, and yeah, I, but my family was walking with the Lord for the most part. And uh, so, you know, we had a nice little family, and we were going to church and doing all these things, teaching Sunday school and all that. But the Lord was saying, said, came to me and said, I'm calling you into the ministry. But I didn't, I wasn't really looking for that. Uh, I was very content being a businessman and, you know, but he called me out of that and there was a lot more to it, but he called me out of that uh, arena into full-time ministry. Uh, and so he did that. But then it, also in the forerunner call, uh, you know, I didn't even know there was a forerunner call at that point in time, until God began to unfold it. And everywhere we turned, people were speaking about forerunners and all that for a season there. And God, we knew that God was calling us that. So anyway, the point is, the forerunner call comes as an invitation. Uh, and you need that. Uh, you'll need that to know that God has called you that. So that when difficult times come, if they do, uh, opposition to your voice, you will know that God has called you and you're doing it to serve him and not for the glory and the pleasure of man. Uh, okay, so that's the first point. It comes as a result of an invitation. Again, we're talking about complete surrender uh, to the Lord. Second, those called as end-time forerunners must count the cost of accepting the invitation of the forerunner. This is really important. Uh, you know, in, the, in our passage we're looking at, uh, Elijah said to Elisha, uh, go back again for what have I done to you? Uh, you know, Elijah knew the heartache, the loneliness, the opposition, the spiritual warfare, and all that that was associated with this call as a forerunner. Uh, and so he was saying to Elisha, you know, make sure before you, before you follow me, make sure this is what you want. You have to count the cost. And of course, Jesus talked about that as in, in general in the concept of, of discipleship. You know, if you're going to build a tower, uh, you got to figure out how much it's going to cost before you build it so you don't run out of money. If you're going to go to war, you need to, you know, prepare for that and count the cost of doing that. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a cost counting. This is in the concept of a general discipleship. But the same is true with a forerunner. If, if you're going to say yes to the invitation, you've got to really count the cost. Uh, and say, okay, I'm willing to do that. Yes, Lord, I want to follow you, and this is what you're calling me to do. If this is how you're calling me to minister, I want to say yes to you. But there is a, there is a time when we need to realize, okay, this is not some fleeting thing where I say yes to it today and tomorrow I go on to the next fad. This is a call that, for me, changed my entire life, changed my entire ministry and my entire calling. And it will for you as well, probably. Uh, you know, maybe not as to the degree it has me, uh, but it will be a significant change uh, in the way God uses you if you'll say yes to it and God has called you to it. Uh, so count the cost. Uh, now, the third principle, again, we're talking about complete, talking about complete surrender. Those called as end-time forerunners must not be double-minded about the call. Uh, Elisha, here's what it says in our passage, Elisha took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen. So anyway, he took the plows, uh, destroyed the plows, and, he, and uh, he took the oxen and sacrificed them. In other words, he said, uh, you know, I'm, not go I'm, doing, I'm going on this, I'm not going back. You know, he destroyed all of his, uh, he left his ability 
to earn a living from his uh, farming uh, of that day. Uh, and so he, can't, you know, he wasn't double-minded about it. He wasn't thinking, okay, I'm just going to do this and you know, if it doesn't work out, I'll go back to this other thing. He, he left everything to follow after Elijah. He wasn't double-minded at all. Uh, I know with me, when I left business, because I was in business with some business partners, and when the Lord called me, uh, I mean, the Lord, I, I won't take the time to go through all the details. It's a long story. But God worked it out miraculously, but... I had to make the decision to sacrifice the oxen and destroy the plow before he came through uh, for me. And it was a very difficult decision, a very difficult decision, but I couldn't be double-minded about it. I couldn't wait and see if everything worked out and then do it, or I couldn't delay it 10 years and then do it. I had to do it then. Uh, the Lord was saying, do it, and I had to do it. And the same was true with the forerunner ministry and starting the church. You have to kind of uh, leave the past behind you. Even with the forerunner ministry, when I began to speak about that at our local church, uh, um, amazingly, many, many people questioned whether that was even a legitimate call. People left the church and all that. And so it would have been real easy to come to go on back, but I, had, I couldn't be double-minded about it. I had to go forward with it. And you're going to have to do the same thing in terms of complete uh, surrender. If you're saying yes to this, you've got to say yes to it. Um, fourth, the fourth, again, about complete surrender. There will be great fulfillment in the lives of those who have surrendered to the, to the forerunner call. Um, there will be fulfillment. I know for me, I would never want to go back. Um, here's what is said to Elisha. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah. I love that. He ran after Elijah. He said, I, I am eager. I am hungry for this. I want it. I desire it. And I'm going after it. Uh, and there was great fulfillment in, in his ministry. And ultimately, he was using really, really powerful ways, uh, so many powerful ways. Uh, but he was eager to pursue it. And there was great fulfillment in it. And that's certainly been the case in my life. Uh, as I pursued this, there's definitely been difficult times. There's been a lot of difficult times, a lot of war, spiritual warfare associated with it, a lot of opposition, a lot of uh, people who don't understand and, and the disappointment of all of that. There's been a, certainly been a lot of that. But God has opened up to me um, revelation truths that I don't think I would have ever gotten had he not called me to this ministry. So it's been fulfilling the fulfillment is, is not in the accolades of man. It's more in the uh, revelation and the relationship with the man, Christ Jesus. Very important uh, that. So anyway, it'll be fulfilling to you if you, if you go after it. Uh, it won't be easy necessarily. It may be, but I doubt it. Uh, it won't be easy, but it will be fulfilling. Uh, so again, complete surrender. And then the fifth point related again to complete surrender. Uh, as the end time forerunners, we must be devoted to the call. We must be devoted to it. Uh, he, Elisha said, let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. Uh, so there's a, there was a devotion to that. He followed Elijah. He left the uh, comfort of his family and he followed Elijah, served him, and minister to him. In other words, we serve and minister in uh, that anointing. He was devoted to the call. Now, I do want to make a point about the balance of the forerunner call and family life. You know, what I'm not saying here, I want to make sure you understand this, I'm not saying that you've got to just leave your family, abandon your family in order to follow this call. And a lot of ministers have done that over the years, and, the, and you know, their children have no part of ministry. Their children don't want any part of that. Their wives, they don't have a close relationship with their wife. There's so many, or husband, there's so many uh, different dynamics and aspects in family life because of ministry. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you uh, abandon your family. Not, uh, the opposite. We need uh, to be committed to our family. Uh, but what I'm saying is you can't place even that above this call, it's, it's, a, 
there's a, there's a tension there for sure, uh, but you've got to go after it. You've got to be devoted to this call without leaving uh, your family or abandoning them. And there's a way to do it, but God will show you. I won't take the time, way too much uh, time to discuss that in this session. Uh, but we have to be devoted uh, to the call. So that's the point of complete surrender. In other words, we've got to be called and commissioned. And one of the things that takes place uh, in that period of the call and between that and the commissioning is we have to completely surrender to the call. Um, now, let's look at the, the final point for this session. Uh, it'll take a while. Uh, uh, is, is called outside the camp. Called outside uh, the camp. Uh, forerunners are going to have to come out of the camp uh, of religious activity and the busyness of the system in order to be a forerunner, uh, in order to be prepared, in order to also to minister into the system. Here, let's, let's look at some scriptures. Uh, Jesus calls his followers outside the camp in order to pursue him and to pursue the bridal city. Uh, if you look at Hebrews chapter 13, 11 through 14, uh, let me just read it. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is, is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering of sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come, which is the bridal city he's talking about, the new Jerusalem. Um, and so Jesus is saying you're going to have to come out of a lot of things, outside the busyness, outside of the routine, outside of uh, uh, the system, in a general sense, in order to be made ready as a bride for Christ. But we're, that's for a different class. We won't talk about that right now. Um, but there is a call outside the camp uh, to forerunners also. Um, God took Elijah outside the camp of the religious activity of the day around him to prepare him for his forerunner ministry. It's, you know, we looked at this scripture before, but it, it says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. Um, so, Again, we'll talk about what happened at Brook Cherith in the next session. But the point is that God called Elijah for three and a half years outside the camp. He pulled him out of the mainland religious activity first to prepare him uh, for his call. He hid him. He hid him in there. So uh, he hid him in a way partly for protection because Ahab didn't like him. He called him a troubler of Israel and he hid him for the protection, the safety of his life. But he also hid him from all that was going on so that God could really work in his life, could prepare him and do the things that he did uh, in there. Um, so we see that. We see also that where Elijah's preparation was outside the camp, John the Baptist, his, pretty much his entire ministry took place outside the camp. He went into the wilderness, out of the mainstream of the religious activity of the day, out of the, out of the busyness of what was going on around the temple and Jerusalem. He took him into the wilderness and people came to him, but he took him out of that uh, activity in order to be that forerunner, outside the arena of mainstream religion. Uh, the Apostle Paul was also called outside the camp for a season of preparation. Um, you know, we talked about that in, in, in a previous point there in Galatians chapter 1 where God took him out and he worked in his life. He gave him, uh, he corrected his doctrine. He corrected his character. Uh, he changed his, mo his motives uh, where there's no deceit in him where he could be a voice. So there was a, he had, but he had to go outside the camp. He had to go outside the system. Remember, he was a leader in the religious system of that day and he had to pull him out of that. Not only pull him out of it in terms of a call, but put him out, pull him out of it physically uh, out of that uh, in order uh, to make him ready uh, for that. Uh, but in addition for Paul, 
Uh, in addition to being prepared outside the camp, Paul also had to come out of the camp of the mainstream religion of the day in order to be able to be a voice into it, to be a voice into it. Um, he had to pull him out of these things so he could be a voice. And we'll talk about the application of this here in just a minute. But you look at the book of Colossians. Look at the book of Colossians. Just think about it. We're not going to turn there. Uh, but you look at the book of Colossians. They were, there was a heresy that was going on in the church at Colossae. Uh, there was uh, the shadows of Judaism. They were pursuing the wisdom of man. They were pursuing intermediary things in addition to the person of Christ. And what did he do? He called them and he said, you can't be involved in all this stuff. Come out of it and, follow, and pursue this man, Christ Jesus. He is the, he is the preeminent one. He is the, he is the firstborn. He is all these things. He was calling them out of these things uh, into that. And God, had, in order to be a voice into that, he, not only for preparation, he couldn't be tang entangled, in his case, Judaism, he couldn't be entangled in all the ritual and all the different issues that were there, the old wineskins of that. He could not be entangled in that and then be a voice to call people out of it. He had to separate one to be prepared and also to be a voice into the system, which is a predominant uh, way that forerunners will be used. Forerunners will be used to call people uh, out of the system. And so in order to do that, uh, we're going to have to come out, one, to be prepared, absolutely, to be, get our message, to get our character refined, to purify our motives, all these things that we talk about. But we're also going to have to come out of the system in order to be a voice uh, into it. Very important. So likewise, forerunners must also come outside the camp of mainline religious issues and activity to be prepared and to be used as a forerunner. Now I want to talk about as to be used as forerunners because we've already talked a lot about the preparation process. But this is really, really uh, important. Uh, if you look at the state of the church, if you, if you look at the state of the church globally, uh, you, you see the approaches that are being used um, around the world. You know, we've shared this a number of times, but when, the last time we were in Africa, or one of the last times we were in Africa, we asked our mentors of our life school, mentors, what, how many are probably in the prosperity gospel? And they said probably 80% of the African church is in the prosperity gospel. Now, the prosperity gospel is external rather than it's internal. It's focused on man rather than it's focused on Christ. Uh, it's, it's, compl it's almost completely in error. Now, that's not to say that, there, that God doesn't want to prosper us in some way, in some fashion. I'm not saying that. But the prosperity gospel is way out of balance and is a doctrinal error. Uh, likewise, in many places, some in Africa, but in other places, the hyper-grace uh, model uh, approach is, is widespread. And what does it do? It basically, this may not be intended by the teachers, but this is the result of it in many, many lives. It gives a license to live in compromise, a license to live in complacency, a license to just go about doing your own thing and believing that that's okay with God. Uh, you see that in the, in the hyper grace. You, with the, the seeker sensitive movement, it's like a a Wall Street, <coughs> Madison Avenue marketing scheme that tries to attract people. Let's see what they want. Let's see what they like. Let's create a religious system that meets their need. And let's don't talk about anything that they don't want because we don't want them to leave. Now, now those movements are all over the place. Uh, there's movements even within the charismatic church in addition to those types of things. I really believe in our life school, our forerunner school class, understanding the end times will deal with this. But there's major era, eras uh, in eschatology. And those eras in eschatology are not only doing uh, disservice because they're not preparing people for what is coming. We'll talk about that in the other uh, classes. But what it's also doing, this eras of eschatology, uh, is, crea is allowing people to create their own doctrines 
uh, that are totally uh, apart from what the Bible says. And it's, ama- it's millions of people are following this. Uh, you know, then if you add a lot of the traditional uh, uh, systems, uh, Catholicism and mainline Protestant churches and denominations, you know, when you begin to put all this together, you think, man, this remnant that God is raising up right now is really, really small. But God wants forerunners to be a voice into it. But here's the issue. Here's the issue. You cannot, whatever you're involved in now, and and hopefully you're not involved in any of these erroneous things, but let's say you are. You cannot keep one foot there and put one foot into the forerunner call. You will never be a voice into the system if you're still entangled in it. Uh, Now, I'm not saying you have to leave your denomination. I'm not saying you have to leave your church. I don't know. God will show you what he's asking you uh, to do. But you cannot be entangled in anything that restricts your your voice or or, uh, entangles you where you are not free to be that voice that God is wanting you to be. You've got to come outside that camp. You've got to do it. You've got to come out Side the camp in order to be that voice. I know I grew up Methodist and, you know, that for me was not a very good experience. Uh, then when I got born again, I was Baptist and that was a lot better experience. And we were at a good church, a good Baptist church. It was a good solid church with a great pastor and all of that. But as God progressively called us to start the church and then to move into this forerunner call, we had to, we, we started out, our, the church we birthed, we started out as a Baptist church. And I love the Baptist. We have a, a number of friends who are Baptists. So uh, we're not, I'm not against the Baptist church, but God called us out of that. He called us out of, out of that, out of being Baptist. He said, you're never going to be able to be my voice into the church, not even the Baptist church necessarily, but any of the church, if you're bound up by that. And, it, and you know, even, uh, I will say this about, not necessarily speaking of Baptists, but over a lot of these movements, there are demonic principalities hovering over these things that you will be under. You think, okay, I can still be a voice into it, maybe, uh, but they're, they're demonic principalities. You've got to come out from that movement in order to get out from under that demonic principality. Uh, in order to get fresh revelation, to get insight, to get the call, to get the burden, and to be a voice back into it. And so uh, that's the point for this coming outside the camp. One, uh, you've got to come out and separate from the busyness of the system uh, in order to be prepared. Now, I'm not saying you have to go live for three years by the Brook Cherith, or you have to go into the wilderness of Judea, or go into Arabia, or all those things. But what I am saying is you're going to have to separate to a degree that God can do a work in you. And it's probably separating more in the spirit, in our case, than it is to separate in terms of a physical location. But we have to separate to be prepared so God can transform us internally and to release message to us. You have to be prepared. But you also have to separate from entanglement in the system in order to be a voice into it. You cannot... See, Paul could not have stayed in Judaism and be a voice back into it. He had to come out of it completely to be that voice. And you'll have to do the same. Uh, But God will lead you. I don't want you to go and turn in your resignation if you're a pastor and whatever denomination you're a part of, I want you to seek God and say, what, is it, what are you saying to me? Uh, you know, but, you, but the point is you cannot be entangled, this is a key word, entangled in a system that restricts you from being free to be a voice. You'll never be a forerunner if you, do, if you are, if you don't come out of that, whatever that means for you. And it can mean many, many different things. And so... Anyway, this is, a, this is the part one of the journey of the forerunner. We, we talked about preparation, and in the next session, we'll, we'll pick up with uh, Elijah's time at Brook Cherith and Zarephath to complete our discussion of preparation, and then we'll move 
into his journey of ministry to show us kind of like a progression that we normally follow. So anyway, uh, God bless you and uh, thank you for being attentive to this and we love you and are excited that you made it this far in uh, the, the, uh, the class Understanding the Forerunner Call. So God bless you and uh, let's let God prepare us all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless.